have him to uh, share his experience with us. Thank you, Somatis, for your wonderful introduction and speaking highly for me. Um, and these are the disclosures and the year hospital team. And the topic will be uh, tips and tricks for a successful transeptal puncture. Um, we, the, it's a technical presentation, so um, um, we as cardiologists sometimes in, in the congresses we come out and we say about our successes and how easy we perform everything and how good we are and we tend to forget about the difficult moments we uh, have when we do these operations, when we actually perform these operations. So this is the transeptal puncture is one part of um, the mitochondrial procedure and not only that when you are there and when you do it, you know how important, how significant is this part of the procedure and that if you're unsuccessful in this part, then uh, you'll probably be unsuccessful at the end of the procedure. And then when we finish the procedure, we tend to forget about it and everything is good. So uh, talking about it, um, it's, it's very important, especially for those of you uh, who are endeavor into this field uh, in the future and start doing mitral clip or other procedures into the left atrium. So what are these procedures? Many of them, as you can see, ablation, the electrophysiologist, mitral and um, supportive devices, left atrial closure, um, and of course all the mitral valve repair and mitral valve replacement that we'll have in the future will be transeptal. So it's not uh, strange that the number of the transeptal punctures over the last decades have been going up all the times. And before you go to do a transeptal for your first time, be sure that you uh, are very good in uh, uh, knowing anatomy, heart anatomy, and um, have all um, the preparation imaging available to understand the anatomy of that given patient. And also be able to use all the available tools for this job and meticulous um, technique and be sure that uh, you can recognize the complications early uh, and act upon them very early. So this is the anatomy of the atrial septum from the right side. You see uh, the fossa valves here, the superior vena cava, the tricuspid valve, the inferior vena cava, and this is exactly the area we want to go with our needle and go through and move into the left atrium. And wh while it seems to be quite small, it's one centimeter about the diameter, as you can see, there are um, endless uh, certain points where you can puncture many options. Um, and this is important, as um, I'll tell you, depending on uh, what exactly what you want to do with your mitral clip, what type of uh, uh, mitral gestation you have to correct, or what type of other procedure um, you uh, are up to. So one location certainly doesn't fit all. Um, and you have, uh, but you have to be into the former ovale because there is the septum is very thin. Uh, it can be easily punctured. You can dilate it uh, without having to do septostomy using balloons. It's easily opening with the dilators of all our guiding catheters. If we go outside of the former valve, then we have a problem because that is muscular part of the septum. It's difficult to puncture. Uh, it's difficult to dilate. You have, we have catheter buckling. We have problems there. And, and then the direction of our system when we cross is also very important because, as you can see, depending uh, if we're heading towards uh, posterior or anterior, towards the aorta, um, we end up at different places into the uh, left atrium. One thing that we have to understand is that the, the planes um, of the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava are different, so the superior is a bit forward compared to the, to the inferior, so every time we move up, uh, we move also anteriorly in relation to the mitral valve. So this is something that we should always remember. And it's true that every time we move posterior 
or anterior on the foramen ovale at the same time we change our height in relation to uh, the mitral valve so when we turn posterior we go higher and when we turn anterior we go lower so these are the anatomy relations you have to appreciate and understand before you start uh, your transeptal uh, uh, the, your transeptal punctures. We, uh, we use the broken bone needle um, in all our cases and we can give this needle different curves. The 50 uh, degrees is the usual curve and um, we sometimes we have to give manually a larger curve when we have uh, for example a, a large right atrium uh, and uh, we have um, to go lower but uh, remember that every time um, you um, you do that, you uh, lose height into the right atrium. And then we have <coughs> the, the various seats that we're using uh, to carry um, the, the needle in. And then when we puncture, um, sometimes uh, we personally always, we use the safe set needle. This is uh, the wire system. Uh, that it's a needle at the end, uh, but when it enters the uh, left atrium, it curves backwards, so it becomes completely automatic, and it's so thin that uh, even if you puncture um, the wall of the right atrium and you're out in the pericardium, nothing is going to happen. So it gives you this extra safety, and it's very stiff when you, when you're in the left atrium, so your needle is always uh, railed over uh, this wire, so uh, it's always easy. Uh, sometimes in those very difficult cases that you are at the border of the muscular septum, or for whatever reason it's, it's fibrous or it's thick, and it's difficult to cross the septum, we can, you, we can uh, do ablation, uh, and there are um, a commercial, a commercially available system like the Bayless needles with a generator uh, that you can do that. Um, and there's also uh, the approach of the poor people uh, when we use the uh, common, the regular diathermy on our needle, uh, and this helps cross, cross, crossing. So this is the, we always start with the puncture of the femoral vein. We're going up with the wire um, and then with uh, um, real uh, time 3D guidance, we can see our wire here in the superior vena cava and the former of our here. So we know <coughs> where we're gonna go. We wanna uh, come down from that area, but always with a direction to there. And here, um, you can see how we um, have the SLO a sheath and the bronchial needle inside and how we gradually um, withdraw the system to come down from the superior vena cava into the uh, left atrium and here at the end you can see here is the um, the SLO broken bro assembly and I think you can see at the end the tending here the tending we cause on uh, the former valley, this is the highest point uh, uh, we can go at the border uh, with the muscle. So where to puncture? It's always good to puncture high. So in that area, I always opt to go high. And this is because um, you have this extra length to work your procedure uh, into the ventricle. Unless you have, there is this concept that if you have FMR, sometimes the cooptation line is deeply into the ventricle. And if you go very high, you may not have the reach with the system. But newer mitral clip uh, generations and the Pascal, they're very long. So you never have a problem that is unreachable. It's the other way around. And then you should remember that you on the three um, D um, uh, three dimensional space, um, you have the superior inferior, which are related to the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. You have the posterior anterior, which is the anterior wall, the posterior uh, part of the thorax, and also you have the height. And when we uh, talk about height, we mean the height in relation to the mitral valve which is not the same with superior because mitral valve is always 
the, the heart is, uh, is uh, somewhere in between horizontal uh, and vertical. It's, uh, it has a, a tilt. So that's why the high and the superior are not the same. There's always an angle between uh, like 45 degrees as is depicted here between them. So remember this because this is the common terminology when we're doing the procedure. It's different to talk about superior and inferior and different about high. And how do we check that? By caval view for the superior and inferior, and the four uh, chamber view to, to check the height here in relation to the annulus of the mitral valve, and so the axis at base to check the anterior posterior. So it's very simple, as you can see. It's not that um, many big secrets. And here, um, we see the tending, and when we see the tending, and we're happy about how superior we are, and how anterior posterior, and how uh, the height that we have, then we advance our um, um, first the safe step. So here we check the anterior posterior, the short axis at base, uh, we're in the middle, and here we check the height. So this is the four chamber view and, and we're really the highest we can be in relation to the mitral valve. So when we are completely satisfied, this is a very crucial part of the procedure. If you get this wrong, then the procedure goes wrong. And also, it's a part of a procedure that if you're not careful, you can cause a, a, a pericardial uh, tamponade and, and um, you, you're in trouble without uh, doing uh, the procedure you're planning to do. Um, so after checking all this very carefully, you take your time because uh, any mistakes, this part of the procedure, um, you, you pay a lot um, for them. And when you cross, you, you, you saw here the safe sept going up, and then it's the time to give heparin. Don't forget this uh, very important part of the procedure when you cross the same tube and you're into the um, left uh, atrium, you give um, the heparin. So here is the safe sept. I don't know if the resolution is good, but you can see the safe sept going up there. And then when you have the safe sept, you advance the brochable needle and you enter. Because you have the safe sept, there is no way that your brochable needle can cause any harm uh, into the left uh, atrium. And then when the needle is uh, um, uh, on, you advance the entire system in and you are done. And then you withdraw the dilator of the SLO. When you do that, uh, always um, have a needle, a lure lock needle, and a spy from the side port because there is a risk of uh, sucking in air and causing air embolism. And then you advance an extra stiff wire, long extra stiff wire into the uh, uh, a left atrium, and um, then you start to do whatever procedure uh, you plan to do. Uh, for the mitral clip, these are the next steps. Um, you get the guide uh, catheter first. So this is the guide catheter. It's now in the system, uh, in the um, left atrium. Uh, initially, you see the dilator here and then you see how we advance it and how the dilator is through, and then the main guide catheter uh, comes at the septum and goes through. So you watch uh, very carefully here. You see those lines are from the dilator, these uh, lines here, and then the, 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 the thicker part is the main uh, guide. And then we remove again the dilator of the guide catheter again with aspiration with a lower lock syringe here. This is a very high risk to um, um, suck in air again, and you have to be very careful. And then after that, um, we can um, direct um, uh, our system. Uh, we insert our mitral clip, the delivery system, and then we always um, uh, aim towards the upper or one pulmonary vein here because this gives us more working length into uh, the left atrium to advance our system. So here is the uh, getting down the clip uh, from the straight position uh, to uh, head towards the mitral valve, and then 
we check the trajectory, we see the movement, we advance just the delivery uh, catheter. So to check the trajectory we have on both directions, so three-dimensionally, here it's lateral and medial, and here is posterior and anterior. And ideally, we should be vertical to those planes in, in, uh, at the same time. Sometimes, in purpose, when we have particular points that we target, uh, we may need to be like a autohanger, so if we target to go, uh, <coughs> like if we have, um, um, if we have a, a, a smaller uh, posterior leaflet, for example, and we want to be able to cut it more easily. So there are certain cases that you don't obey to the rule of 100% uh, uh, coaxiality in both these planes. So this is uh, fluoroscopy uh, of how we advance the uh, mitrically, but I don't think it's important. And the complications, complication of transeptal puncture, of course, the most dreaded is pericardial tamponade, um, atrial stitch that may lead to pericardial tamponade, uh, aortic puncture, perforation, uh, you must be blind to go there, uh, but sometimes it happens, air embolism and thromboembolism, which are real um, uh, uh, dangers if you're not careful, if you don't pay um, very uh, meticulous attention to all the details. And uh, this is the atrial stitch uh, that uh, you're very posterior, very anterior to the fossa valleys, and without understanding, you may get out first of the right atrium and then into the left atrium. So you should avoid that uh, 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 trigons. Of, um, uh, at, the, at the end of the um, septum that uh, we see on um, transvaseal echo. Complications are rare, but um, um, and certainly with experience they're going down. You, you see here uh, very, very low, it's 0.7% um, serious complications. Air, air embolism, um, you, you should always remember that every time you remove a dilator of a sith that is positioned in the left atrium, there is a risk of sucking in air. Uh, so always asp aspiration. And clot embolism, always remember to give the heparin when uh, you do your transeptal and always to uh, follow up your ACTs and give additional sorts of heparin as required. Sometimes when um, uh, you use just the needle without the safe sept, you may get this um, tissue core into the um, uh, lumen of the needle, and if you, for whatever reason, you flush the needle, you may get an embolism from that part. So this is something to remember. So challenging anatomy, if you have a very large uh, left atrium or right atrium, or generally the anatomy of the heart is um, altered for um, disease, for, from uh, the disease. Uh, when you have aortic root uh, aneurysm, kyphoscoliosis, atrial septal aneurysm, thick atrial septum, and uh, pacing wires, most of the cases they don't cause problem, uh, except from problem in assessing the transesophageal uh, echocardiograms because you see a lot of lines into the right atrium. So this is a, a example of a thick atrial septum. In some very rarely, you don't, uh, you cannot cross that, and you need to do a balloon septostomy to be able to go through. And eyes. Um, um, has been tried and uh, have been used uh, by some centers uh, for mitrically, but it's not something that gained acceptance. Um, uh, in contrast, ICE is used, um, increasingly used for a PFO closure, for the ASD closure, because there um, the um, the the uh, views have been somehow uh, finalized and standardized. Um, so the disadvantages of TE are well known, I'm not going to stay here, and um, certainly using TE for uh, doing your transeptal puncture gives you this extra safety um, that is needed. Uh, but again, if you don't follow all the details as described earlier, and, um, and you um, and you cut uh, curves, uh, you may be in trouble. Um, 
So specific tips, if you have a PFO, uh, it may be difficult because it may guide you very anteriorly. So try to avoid the lumen of the PFO and get your posterior direction. Um, and uh, if you have a um, um, target to close the uh, left atrial uh, appendage, then you have uh, to go uh, a bit anterior, as I uh, told you earlier. So your direction should be anterior, which means that you should go posterior. Because if you come uh, at your puncture anterior, then the direction, the heading of your system will be posterior and it will make uh, the closure more difficult. Um, uh, the same thing. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I don't really know if uh, Professor Manolis or Dr. Mustoyanis are in here. Uh, in that case, Kostas, uh, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. Um, uh, transeptal punctures have been uh, performed without TE probably for decades. Uh, electrophysiologists and uh, also you uh, performing um, balloon uh, valvuloplasties in mitral valve didn't really use uh, transophageal echo during the uh, transeptal puncture. Uh, in my mind, it's not a matter of safety. Is um, in mitral valve clip uh, uh, procedures you need to go through uh, certain parts of the uh, atrial septum uh, so that uh, you increase uh, uh, the possibility for the procedure to be successful. Uh, am I correct with that? You're, com you're completely correct, absolutely correct. And you have to target certain areas of the fossa valleys to go through and also attain certain direction of your system to, to have the right uh, heading. Also, the height is very important. You have to measure the distance from the mitral valve. Around four centimeters or something like that? Yeah. yeah, four centimeters is the minimum usually. But when you start doing transeptal with transesophageal um, guidance, it's very difficult to go back to, to go do back. it blindly uh, because um, you have seen strange cases and things happening when you have a transesophageal echocardiography and that you wouldn't be able to get out of the problems without this uh, guidance, the imaging guidance. So it's very difficult, I think, even for guys that are doing uh, balloon vulvoplasty, uh, mitral balloon vulvoplasty for decades without any guidance, if they start using transesophageal echo for guidance for mitral clip or other procedures, to go back and do it without guidance. So it's not only a matter of safety, it's m more uh, a matter of uh, helping you to be more successful in the procedure itself. Yes, exactly. At this stage, yes. It was like a case that was shown earlier of a TAVI procedure without echocardiography, that after uh, putting the valve, they had a problem with the left main after a few hours. And when they g went back, they did an IVOS and they found that that was just a dissection a part of a leaflet, mm -hmm. of an aortic valve leaflet. It, was a, it wasn't a native corneal Doctor problem. Spart, yes. okay. So if you had the transfacial echocardiography during the TAVI, you would have seen that and acted on, on earlier. Similar. We are out of time. I think that we must move on.